complete without uh, a great economist to give you the overview of where we're going and what that looks like. So now it's my very uh, significant pleasure uh, to introduce you to Jeremy Thorpe, who's the Chief Economist from PwC. Welcome, Jeremy. Morning, Mary. Oh, I've got a yellow face on the screen instead of you. I'm hoping everybody else can see you. Never mind. You. We might get on with it and let the te technicals um, uh, speak for themselves. Right. So, Queensland, interesting state, very dependent upon the visitor economy. Tourism is critical, as is infrastructure and goodness knows what else. Queensland's got a higher proportion of tourism businesses than any other state. What is COVID doing to Queensland and therefore the rest of the country by, by extension? So Queensland is unique and you've just flagged it there. And one of the real challenges that we saw with COVID is obviously that the tourism industry was affected first. Um, and what that means in a Queensland context is that regional Queensland um, suffers greater uh, disruption and downturn. In comparison to every other state, the profile means that this is very much a regional problem in, in Queensland. Obviously, problems felt broadly, but as you've already mentioned today, Cairns, um, we also see it on the Gold Coast. Those uh, areas uh, which have had particular exposure to tourists have had a particular downturn. So they've gone into the downturn first. It means they're going to come out of the downturn last, probably, given that the borders at the international level are going to be the real constraint. Fascinated to hear the issue that people think it's about three years um, till, till I see recovery. Uh, the, even the RBA is now suggesting that it's more than two years as a nation to get back to where we were pre-GFP. That's a prior, sorry, pre-COVID, confusing my recession. Um, <laughs> and what, what that means is that three years is probably closer to the economy as a whole. There's a real risk that the tourism sector is going to lag even that. So I'm slightly more pessimistic, but if anyone can pull out of this, it's people with great product, as been mentioned today. Right, okay, so... Second border closure, because, you know, there's a bit of a theme uh, arising oh, here. It's all about the borders. Yes. Um, if you look at the second border closure, how devastating has that been compared to the first time round? And what do you think about this exercise of nobody gets to open up till Christmas? What are the implications of that? So can I be slightly controversial, given I've seen the questions coming through? <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a trade off that, that we're making. And what we see in the states that either have very low COVID outbreaks or, and they're the ones that have tended to um, impose the border constraints, the economy actually has been growing since that first lockdown. Um, and let's not confuse a border closure or order lockdown. It was mentioned before. The Victorian economy is not a situation you want to be in. So constraining the virus, this is not talking about elimination. We, we are going to have to learn to live with this till we find a, a vaccine. But the consequences of having a large uh, community transmission that you cannot easily trace, as we've seen in Victoria, are really significant, significant on the economy. Just to give you some relativities, um, this is ABS data about um, payrolls. So this is employees and how many jobs have been lost. Um, nationally... Um, we're down about 4.5%. In other words, 4.5% of average people who earn payroll, uh, PAYG is, is down. 4.5%. Um, In Queensland, it's down 3.4%. So Queensland is far better than the national average in that context. And I think part of it is it does not have that community transmission. Obviously, the price to pay is for the tourism industry particularly. Um, and... This is comparing to Victoria when it was at stage three lockdown. Um, what we saw then is the Gold Coast actually had more job losses than Victoria in stage three lockdown. Cairns had just less uh, than uh, Victoria at stage three lockdown. So effectively, the disruption in those real hotspots for tourism have been the equivalent of the Victorian stage three lockdown. But the rest of the state has been growing um, back from that initial lockdown. So this is a one where, in a sense... The tourism industry is taking it for the team for the rest of the community. Right. Interesting, but strangely not comforting, Jeremy. Let no, me just say that. Be. And now that we've got your happy, smiling face up on the screen and we're enjoying what the whole country now does, which is look at where you live, I'm admiring the zebra head. Very nice. It's not Directly real, not to re reinforce that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, moving on. Um, 
I mean, Queensland is a, a, a state very dependent upon aviation, yeah. uh, simply because of the size of the state and because of, you know, you know we're a long-haul destination, as I've mentioned earlier. Um, with international travel, you know, really being a long way off, um, what do you think the chances are that domestic travel, uh, if the aviation industry is given some encouragement... How much can the domestic travel market fill the gap of that international travel piece? To me, this has to be the pivot for the industry in the short term. I'm not telling anyone I think anything particularly novel. Um, but just to give you some national numbers, uh, we spend Australians spend about $40 billion going overseas each year. Obviously, they're not doing that. Um, so that's $40 billion that, in a sense, is sitting in people's mortgage offsets and they're, um, they're paying off their credit cards at the moment. Um, we nationally lose about $20 billion of international people coming in. So the aim has to be to convert those people who would have otherwise gone overseas uh, to now think about let's not hang out for that hope in the, in the mid to long term that I will get overseas, but actually convert it to a domestic holiday. So aviation becomes critical in that. As you flagged effectively, opening the borders becomes critical. So it's not just an intrastate issue. This becomes a national opportunity for people to holiday. Um, that's, the, that's the prize, I think, hanging out there. It's not easy. It's not a quick exercise. We're not necessarily uh, built from day one to, to uh, flip that switch. But there is a pool of money of people who would have otherwise travelled. We need to think, get them to think about domestic travel. Absolutely. So, I mean, accepting, though, that essentially it will never wholly fill the gap left it by international travel. And I don't think we should think about it in that way because we know in a recession people are more conservative, we know they save more, we know they're less likely to spend on discretionary items and holidays are seen as discretionary items. But there is a, a, a bucket of money that we need to be maximising to the degree we can into domestic holidays. So we've heard from um, both Kate as Minister and the Leader of the Opposition about how incredibly important the major infrastructure build projects are in terms of recovery. Where do you see that fitting into this? Because it seems to me that, you know, every state that can now is a thriving hotbed of new infrastructure projects. Is that what we should be seeing? Uh, yes and no. So the yes is we know that infrastructure, investment in infrastructure is one of the best things you can do to stimulate the economy. Um, the goal there has to be put it into productive assets. So spending on infrastructure for infrastructure's sake is not the right outcome. But what we also know is spending on maintaining or fixing or some of those small projects are often far better from a benefit-cost perspective. Um, fix things, getting it working, screwdriver ready. So not even shovel ready. That shovel still take a while. But screwdriver, fixing, putting things back together. Um, we need the long-term big projects. Let's not deny that. But if we're going to get jobs flowing sooner rather than later and the investment is in people, um, those maintenance and smaller projects are actually critical in the short term. So we need a dual infrastructure strategy here. And I think that applies to uh, tourism-related infrastructures just as much as any other form of infrastructure. Right. So just another thought process, because we're almost out of time, Jeremy. In terms of everybody's mentioned Victoria several times this morning, just how much of an impact would a state like Victoria's closure be having on Queensland at this point in time, beyond just the tourism part of the puzzle? So it, we're, at, we're at risk, actually, of not coming out of recession in a technical sense but being dragged back to it. One of the key mentions this morning was uh, you are a sharer of the GST. So you don't get your GST from expenditure in Queensland. It's shared between all the states. You will be dragged down from a state government perspective on that basis. Clearly, though, Victoria, um, the shutdown posed many challenges that had to be worked through very quickly around international, sorry, domestic supply chains that people hadn't necessarily tweaked, um, that we didn't have the same capacity in every jurisdiction, that Victoria in some cases um, was actually a logistics hub for the rest of the country. So there are those challenges that individual businesses have been trying to work through with governments from uh, all, all states and territories. Uh, but as long as we are dragged, as long as there are restrictions there because of COVID, we are going to see a response by other jurisdictions around borders. So 
we need to see Victoria get on track and it's on it's heading in the right direction, so that, that's a good thing. But until we feel comfort that that is on uh, a manageable level where track and trace works, I think it's around 200 a day new cases is the kind of benchmark for when that becomes a, quote, manageable exercise. We're going to see those flow on implications for Queensland. Um, so on, just, because, just because you know I'm the eternal optimist, Jeremy, yes. um, how important do you think the trans-Tasman bubble piece is? Because if we can get that mechanism open, Queensland's the key to this. If we don't have Queensland, we don't get any real leisure tourists out of New Zealand. It's, it's just lots of lovely people coming to visit friends and family. Don't tell the Tasmanians that. I'm not sure they agree with that position. I think they, they, <laughs> they're going to have their own little bubble with them. Oh, I think we're going to see, as international borders open up, there will be a very restrained and constrained um, approach to that. And New Zealand feels like, ignoring or maybe putting aside one moment the initial or the current outbreak that it's got, it has a low exposure. We're going to be looking for partners and that we're not going to open the, the borders up as a whole as bowls. We will be very targeted, we suspect. Um, and so it feels like that um, New Zealand will be first off the rank in that. And so Queensland and New Zealand, yes, that feels like a, a, a natural home. Um, I, I hope we've started advertising into New Zealand already. Yes, I have a sneaking suspicion that may be the case. And on that hopefully positive note, Jeremy, I'm going to say thank you very much for your insights once again. Always helpful, always right on the money. So thank you so much, Jeremy, and do Thanks take care. Time. Cheers.